Thanks, Attica Badgers. Um, thanks, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and let's hope this all works. There we go. All right. Um, so let's talk about who Manasseh ben Israel was first. Um, if he's the most famous Jew in the world, he's pro his name probably does not enjoy the renown today that it did um, in the 17th century. This is not Manasseh ben Israel. Um, this is uh, an etching by Rembrandt from 1636, and for a long time it was taken to be a portrait of Manasseh ben Israel, but scholars generally agree now that it is not uh, Manasseh and really can't be given the age of the individual here and Manasseh's age in 1636. This is not Manasseh ben Israel either. Um, this is a painting by Hovert Flink, one of Rembrandt's contemporaries, and it too had been taken to be a portrait of Manasseh ben Israel. But again, scholars are pretty, um, pretty much in agreement that this is not a portrait of Manasseh. Although you can see how the two men um, look alike. This is Manasseh ben Israel, um, and this is an engraving by Sola Metalia, who was an artist and a member of the Amsterdam Portuguese Jewish community. Manasseh was born in 1604 uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, but in Lisbon, Portugal, and in the Iberian Peninsula generally, um, Jews had been forced to convert to Catholicism in Spain in 1492 and in Portugal in 1496. Um, they were given in Spain the option of converting or leaving. Um, and many of them left and settled in Portugal. Which didn't have an, uh, didn't have the expulsion order yet, um, and then when Portugal issued its expulsion order, um, the Jews, the uh, sorry, yeah, the Jews were given the option of converting or leaving, but they were not allowed to leave. Uh, so many of them continued to practice Judaism in secret. Now, if you were Jewish, the Inquisition didn't care at all about you, but if you were a Christian, and especially uh, a recent convert, even if a forced convert to Christianity, a so-called new Christian. The Inquisition took very great interest in whether or not you, your conversion was sincere and whether you were pa practicing Judaism in secret. Um, whether they were, in fact, practicing Judaism in secret, um, Manasseh's family came under suspicion and his father suffered grievous torture at the hands of the Inquisition. And so uh, shortly after Manasseh's birth, the family fled Portugal um, they spent some time in France in La Rochelle, which happened to be a, a fairly tolerant haven, both for Protestants and for new Christians. And in 1613, or probably 1614, they settled in Amsterdam. And the arrow points to uh, the neighborhood or the island called the Vloyenburg. Um, this is one of the newer districts of Amsterdam in the 17th century as a result of the city's expansion. And the Jews who started arriving here at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century, um, the wealthier ones tended to settle along this street here that you see me moving my cursor on. Um, and it quickly became called the Yoda Breskat, that is the Jews Broad Street. And it was home not just to Jews, but to artists. In fact, this was the center of the city's art world in the 17th century. Um, if you can see where I'm moving the cursor now, that's Rembrandt's house right there. And if you go to Amsterdam and the Rembrandt House Museum, this is where you're going. Uh, Spinoza, since I'm sure you're all curious about this, uh, lived back here. Manasseh, the, the poor Sephardic Jews, that is Jews from Spain and Portugal, tended to settle on this island here. Um, their houses were closer together. They were made of wood and not brick. The wealthier Sephardim settled along this road here. Um, who were these Jews? Well, most of them were, in fact, uh, refugees from the Inquisition um, in 1492, 1496, and throughout the 16th century, Jews who fled Spain and Portugal ended up in many cities around the Mediterranean, including Venice, Salonika, um, they ended up in, in Fez, Morocco, but quite a large number uh, fled to Antwerp at first, uh, which was still part of the Spanish Empire, but a little further away from the Inquisition. But then when things started to get a little more heated in Antwerp, a large number of the conversos, that is the new Christians who had settled in Antwerp, moved um, a little bit eastward and settled in Amsterdam. 
And once in Amsterdam, they were allowed to revert back to Judaism, um, both tacitly and in a sense explicitly. Uh, the Amsterdam uh, municipal authorities were a relatively tolerant lot at this point. And while they were not willing to let Catholics practice openly, they were willing to allow Jews to practice their religion in public. Um, there's a story from the early years of how the uh, Amsterdam sheriff and his men heard strange sounds coming from a basement, and they thought it was a Latin mass. And so they burst in expecting to find Catholics uh, practicing uh, their mass. And so everybody was arrested because this was a Protestant nation, and they weren't going they weren't about to let Catholics start um, settling there and practicing openly. But when it was explained to the sheriff that, in fact, the sounds that they heard were not Latin, but Hebrew, and that the individuals were not Catholics, but Jewish, everybody was released. And by the uh, end of the 16 teens, there were three well-populated Jewish congregations in Amsterdam. And so this is a community where Manasseh and his family settled, um, around 1613 and 1614. This is um, this gives you a picture of one of the homes of the wealthier uh, members of the community, which was then converted into a synagogue. Um, even though this um, this engraving comes somewhat later, uh, it gives you a sense of the wealth of these Sephardic Jews. They were merchants, they were professionals, and unlike the Ashkenazic Jews who started settling in Amsterdam, um, in the 1630s in greater number, and especially in the 1640s and 50s after the massacres uh, in Eastern Europe, um, the Ashkenazic Jews tended to be poor, um, even though they were, in a way, more knowledgeable Jews because they had not been cut off from Jewish texts and Jewish practices for so long, like the Portuguese and Spanish converses had been. Nonetheless, the Sephardic Jews looked down upon the Ashkenazic Jews um, and really wanted to have nothing to do with them. You were not allowed to, if you were a member of the Portuguese Jewish community, you were not allowed to marry um, a, a member of the Ashkenazic community. Um, you could receive a harem or punishment for that. And in fact, at one point, the Sephardic community had taken up a charitable collection, um, both to relieve the poverty of the Ashkenazic Jews, but also to send some of them back to Eastern Europe. So there was no love lost between these two communities. By the 1620s, um, Manasseh, a, a pre precocious young man, was already functioning as a rabbi. He was also very prolific. Um, he wrote over the course of his career uh, treatises that were directed at both Jewish and Gentile audiences. Um, these were works of theology where he addressed questions of Jewish law, of Jewish um, beliefs, question, he, uh, treatises on biblical criticism. In fact, his, his most, um, his most uh, magisterial work uh, in four volumes was called The Conciliator, in which Manasseh tries to reconcile all the passages of the Hebrew Bible that seem to be contradictory. So, for example, you have the two creation accounts, you have dates that don't match, um, and he felt that, in fact, he could reconcile all of these um, contradictions, all of these inconsistencies, and he did so in four huge volumes. He also wrote works of philosophy dealing with such questions as free will, uh, the nature of sin, predestination. He wrote books on Jewish law. He wrote a guide to Jewish life for new Christians who were um, now reintegrating themselves into Jewish practice, because again, they had been um, cut off from Jewish practice in Spain and Portugal, and they needed guidance once they arrived in Amsterdam on what normative Judaism expected. He wrote a Hebrew grammar. His greatest claim to fame, though, both in Amsterdam, uh, in the Netherlands, and across Europe, was as the first Hebrew publisher in Amsterdam. In the late 20s, he got himself a set of Hebrew typeface and became a prolific publisher of texts in Hebrew, um, but also works in Spanish, Portuguese, Yiddish, uh, even English and Dutch. And without question, he was the most important publisher of Judaica in Europe in the first half of the 17th century.
He also had a very wide-ranging correspondence. Oh, sorry, here's the title page of Conciliador. Um, and it's, uh, it appears in both Latin and Spanish here. And the title is uh, The Conciliator or um, On the Agreement of All the Places of Holy Scripture, which um, seem to be repugnant to each other. He also had a wide-ranging correspondence. This is one of his letters, so you can get a sense of his handwriting. Um, this letter was written to a man named Isaac Voschus, who was a leading humanist scholar. Um, his correspondence was primarily with Gentiles uh, across Europe. Uh, Voschus was Dutch, but we have um, correspondence uh, by Manasseh with scholars in England, in France, in Eastern Europe, in Italy. Um, he had a very broad network. And he was widely regarded, especially by Gentiles. In fact, by Gentiles, not so much by Jews. He was regarded as the Jewish expert on a number of topics. And when, let's say, a, a preacher or humanist scholar somewhere wanted to know the Jewish view on a, a matter of historical interest, a matter of legal interest, on a theological question, on a philosophical question, they often wrote to Manasseh because they regarded him as representative of the Jewish traditions, and they hoped that he would explain for them, for example, do does the Jewish tradition believe in free will? Uh, a Calvinist, um, a Calvinist scholar wrote to him on just that question, expecting Manasseh to agree with the Calvinists that no, there is no such thing as free will; everything is predestination. Uh, and was somewhat taken aback when Manasseh engaged in a very strong defense of freedom of the will and how a person is able, through their own actions, through their own free choices, to determine their fate. What's interesting is that while Manasseh was regarded across Europe as perhaps the most knowledgeable and reliable Jewish uh, spokesperson, he always felt undervalued in his own community, and rightly so, he was undervalued. Um, there were four rabbis over the course of his career. Um, Chief Rabbi Saul Levi Mortera, uh, he was first in rank. Uh, second in rank was um, Isaac Abu Abda Fonseca, um, also from Portugal. Um, Manasseh was third in rank, and then uh, David Pardo was the fourth rabbi in rank. However, Manasseh was the least well-paid by far. Uh, Mortera was getting upwards of 600 guilders a year, while Manasseh was being paid 150 guilders a year. And so he really was undervalued in his own community, perhaps because he was regarded as too involved in outreach to the Gentile world. Um, and I don't think he was the scholar that, let's say, Rabbi Mortera was. Um, and I think for, the, for his entire life, Manasseh suffered not just um, resentment over this, but a good deal of financial problems because he was so poorly paid. He also didn't seem to enjoy great relations with the leaders of the community. Um, in 1640, there was an incident, um, which I'll, I'll describe. Um, his brother was a man named Jonah, his brother-in-law, was a man named Jonah Abrabanel. And Jonah may have been involved in an incident where some posters were um, put around the community impugning the business practices of some members of the community, saying they were being unscrupulous and um, engaging in unfair competition. And so these posters named names and accused these people of being shady business people. And so when Jonah Abrabana was called before the directorate of the community to uh, address these charges, uh, Manasseh felt that he wasn't treated very properly. Um, they thought, Manasseh thought that he wasn't, that Jonah, as a leading member of the community, was not shown proper respect. And so he lost his temper. And um, I'm trying to get rid of some of these, um, here we go. I'm going to get rid of some of these pictures on this side so you can see this. Um, and here um, we have a good deal of documentation from this community. Um, and these are in the record books of the Amsterdam Portuguese Jewish community that's now in the municipal archives of the city of Amsterdam. 
<clears throat> and here's the uh, contemporary description of the incident as told by one of the directors of the community. A large part of the assembly left its place, whereupon um, Manasseh turned on them, that is the directors of the community, without being willing to calm himself as he was continuously warned to do. So the directors are saying, Manasseh, calm down. Um, Manasseh is losing his temper about the way in which his brother-in-law had been treated. Until finally, two parnasim, that is, uh, directors of the synagogue, stood up in order to make him be quiet. And indeed, since they could not do it with sufficient words, used the punishment of harem. Uh, harem was a way of ostracizing somebody, cutting them off. If you're under harem, you can't uh, participate in a minion, you can't be called to the Torah. You are essentially uh, cut off, not just from liturgical activities in a synagogue, but from economic and social activities. A person under harem um, cannot um, enjoy meals with other members of the community. Uh, usually the harem is lifted, uh, in, lifted when somebody apologizes for their transgressions and pays a fine. Uh, the most famous harem of the period was, of course, Spinoza's that was permanent, and he was expelled with great prejudice. So they ordered him to stop and return to his house. He countered with a loud voice. He would not. Then the Parnassim, who were in the synagogue, came together. And since the disturbance continued further, they confirmed the punishment of Cherem in order to make him, Manasseh, stop. And they ordered as well that no one speak with him. And so Manasseh's Cherem um, lasted for a day. Um, trying to forward this here now. Let's see if this works. There. Manasseh, in fact, lost his temper at this point. Raising his voice and pounding on the table, Manasseh said in a serious fashion all the unbridled thoughts that came into his mind, so that finally one of the Parnassim apprised him that he is the cause of various disturbances. The Parnassim told him to leave the chamber and that they regarded him as cut off, karet. He responded to that with a loud voice that he was putting them under harem and not the Parnassim him and other such shameful things. So you get a sense of uh, Manasseh's personality here, uh, perhaps his temper, uh, and as well the nature of his relationship with the directors. They really were losing patience with him at this point. What about his relationship with other rabbis? Well, that wasn't so great either. In 1629, um, Rabbi Abawab, the second rabbi, um, was on a committee that censor censored Manasseh because Manasseh's publishing business had published a work by Joseph Solomon del Medigo called Sefer Elim. Uh, and this was regarded as a very transgressive, even heretical book. And so Manasseh was censored for publishing this and distributing it in the community. In 1640, um, this is after the Dutch had conquered parts of Brazil. And so a number of Portuguese Jews from Amsterdam settled in this part of Brazil, in Recife, and established uh, a community there. And it's they, um, they owned several plantations, and sadly also engaged in the slave trade. Um, and they controlled a large part of the sugar trade from Brazil. Uh, raw sugar would go from Brazil to the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands, it would be refined into, sh into sugar. Um, so these Portuguese Jews were able to settle in Brazil because when the Dutch had conquered Brazil from the Portuguese, um, there was no inquisition in this part of the country. Um, and so the, the Jews were free to settle there. So in 1640, the uh, Portuguese Jews in Recife were looking for a rabbi. Manasseh decided that he was going to throw his hat in the ring and try to get this position. Uh, at least this would get him a raise. Um, and perhaps allow him to play a bigger role, a bigger rabbinic role than he was being allowed to in Amsterdam. Uh, he clearly wanted to get out of Amsterdam for a while. He was chafing under his relationship with the community and with the other rabbis. Unfortunately, um, the job went to Abouab, not Manasseh. So Manasseh stayed in Amsterdam. Rabbi Abouab went to Brazil, which I suppose was not bad for Manasseh because it got Abouab out of the way. Um, and this meant that Manasseh could take over some of Abouab's teaching duties in the upper levels of the school, and also get a bit of a raise. 
However, by 1654, the Portuguese had reconquered this part of Brazil. And so the Dutch and all the Portuguese Jews that had come with them um, had to flee. Uh, many of them went to the islands in the Caribbean, uh, Curacao, for example. Many of them went to New Amsterdam. Um, and this was the first Jewish community in what would soon become New York. Uh, Abu Ab, however, went back to Amsterdam. And Manasseh went back to position, his third position, his low salary, and his teaching in the elementary school. Then there was Chief Rabbi Saul Levi Mortera. Mortera and Manasseh definitely did not get along at all. In 1640 new, 1642, we know that they were sort of sniping at each other in their sermons over the question of how to interpret Torah. Mortera was something of a literalist. He always preferred a literal and direct reading of the text of the Torah, whereas Manasseh leaned more towards figurative or metaphorical readings, especially when it was a matter of trying to reconcile different passages that seemed inconsistent. Well, if you interpreted one of the passages metaphorically, you could make everything fit. But the two rabbis were accusing each other in their sermons of not knowing how to interpret Torah. Then, in February of 1653, February 10th, 1653, we find this text in the community's record book. On the 3rd of Nisan, the men of the Ma'amad, that is the governing board, having considered the past disputes between the esteemed rabbis of this holy community, the esteemed Rabbi Saul Levi Mortera and the esteemed Rabbi Manasseh ben Israel, and the fact that once again they have fallen into a dispute the members of the Ma'amad have agreed that the said rabbis should be suspended for two months from their rabbinical duties and from giving sermons, and that during the said two months they would not earn a salary, nor would they be paid in any way, neither with any type of goods, nor by any other means, nor with any type of luxury. So that was February 10th, 1653. Less than a week later, we find this text in the record book. The men of the Mamad, having learned of some disagreements that have arisen between the esteemed rabbi Saul Levi Mortera and Manasseh ben Israel that are in need of remediation, the men ha has determined that the said esteemed rabbis should be suspended from going up to the Ark of the Torah, giving sermons and performing their duties for the amount of time that the men of the Mamad see fit. So obviously, Mortera and Manasseh didn't um, cease their sniping, they just carried it on. And then they were treated um, to this suspension of duties. Then, um, about a year later, this is March 21st, 1654, we read this. We hereby warn the esteemed rabbi Saul Levi Mortera and Manasseh ben Israel to restore a good relationship and friendship and to always maintain the state of decorum that the Mahmud would find satisfactory. Moreover, if between them there should be contrary opinions regarding matters of the law, on no account should they make this public, either within the congregation or outside it, without first coming to some agreement, and that neither within the congregation nor in public should they offend or contradict each other. So there you have Manasseh ben Israel and Rabbi Mortera. Um, a month after this document, we have a final entry on what's called the differences between the esteemed rabbis. And uh, in April 1654, there's a document that says that the next time, quote, the tension between the two men breaks out, the person who begins it and fails to fulfill his obligation and best keep the peace will be removed from his position and forced to pay a fine. That's actually the last we read about the dispute between the two. We don't know what the outcome was. They were both still members or rabbis in good standing of the community. So perhaps they patched it up and just engaged in a, a nice cold war or cold peace. Um, but I find it hard to believe that the two men became um, friends uh, at this point. In late 1655, so slightly more than a year later, Manasseh leaves Amsterdam for England. Now, I think part of this was, again, just his desire to get out of Dodge. Um, to leave this community that he felt was not valuing him and, in fact, was perhaps uh, mistreating him. But his trip to England um, was also 
part of a larger project, a lifelong project. Manasseh was a, a messianist. That is, he believed that the Messiah's coming was, if not imminent, at least in the near future. The problem was that, according to Jewish tradition, the Moshiach would not come until the Jews were scattered to all the corners of the world. In this period, there was a tribe in the Americas that was discovered, and this tribe claimed to be descendants from Reuben. And so there was a great deal of talk in Europe about how one of the lost tribes of Israel has been found. And this generated all sorts of messianic fervor. Manasseh took these reports seriously. He didn't think that this was actually a tribe of Israel, but perhaps a remnant of one of the tribes, perhaps a tribe of Reuben. But this inspired him to uh, write a work called The Hope of Israel, in which he lays out his messianic vision, what he thinks the messianic period will involve, perhaps even what, um, what contemporary events presage the coming of the Messiah. However, uh, if the Jews were supposed to be scattered to all corners of the earth, that meant that if there were any nations where the Jews were not still not allowed to settle, this was going to prevent the coming of the Messiah. And England was one of those places, because in 1290, um, the Jews had been kicked out of the country and forbidden to return. Now, even though there were some individual Sephardic Jews in London, um, one of whom I think was a physician serving the king, um, there was not uh, an open and official Jewish community in England. So Manasseh's project in 1655, late 1655, um, would be to go to England and lobby for the readmission of the Jews to that country. And he even had the support of Oliver Cromwell in this. He claims that Cromwell invited him to come over. And this was not, not, a, not a bad move on Cromwell's part because he recognized that the Sephardic Jews in Amsterdam were making a very significant contribution to the Dutch economy. So he thought, well, we, we want one of those. We want one of those communities as well. Um, unfortunately, Parliament didn't agree and the negotiations over readmission came to naught. It was never really decided. Um, and essentially, the, uh, the topic just went, went silent. Um, Manasseh had brought his son Samuel over with him. And sadly, Samuel died in London. And Manasseh was bringing his body back to the Netherlands for burial. And he landed in Middleburg um, in the Netherlands. Um, and he himself passed away there in 1657. And his body was brought to Amsterdam for burial. So that's that gives you a sense of the trials and tribulations, the ups and downs, the fame and fortune, well, not fortune, but the fame and the infamy of Manasseh's life, both within the Jewish community of Amsterdam and across Europe. There's one final topic I'd like to talk about, um, and it's a really fascinating one because it has to do with uh, Manasseh's relationship with uh, an artist we all know and love, and that is Rembrandt. Scholars have long debated the question of what was, if anything, Manasseh's relationship with Rembrandt. They were essentially neighbors, because as I showed you on that map earlier on, um, Rembrandt lived right across the canal from where Manasseh lived, right in the heart of the Jewish community. And there's long been a myth that Rembrandt had a special affection for the Jewish people and that in his works he shows them um, with an unprecedented sympathy. Um, I, I think that's just mythology. Um, and yet we do know that Rembrandt did sketch and uh, did sketch his Jewish neighbors and perhaps incorporated many of them into some of his paintings of scenes from the Hebrew Bible. So Rembrandt and Manasseh were neighbors. Um, were they also friends? I seriously doubt it. Um, you'll see in books about Rembrandt talk about his being close friends with Manasseh, but we really have no evidence for that whatsoever. However, were they collaborators? Well, that seems to be not just possible, but likely. Um, and there's two projects on which we should focus for addressing that question. 
The first is this painting, uh, Belshazzar's Feast. And this is the scene from the book of Daniel, where Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, is hosting a feast using the utensils and the pitchers and tableware that his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem when it was sacked uh, by, by, by the Babylonians. And in the middle of the feast, this hand comes out of nowhere, according to the story in Daniel, uh, and writing some words on the wall, many, many tekel ufarsin. Nobody in the king's court could interpret the words. So the king called some of his ministers or his wise men. Nobody could make sense of this strange writing. So then he called in uh, Daniel, one of the Israelite um, captives. And Daniel read the words on the wall and said, uh, it's many, many tekel ufarsin. Um, the reason why nobody could read it is because it's written um, not right to left horizontally, but right to left in vertical columns. So you can see that there. Uh, and Daniel said, well, what that means is, uh, King um, King Belshazzar, is that your days are numbered because Amina, a tekel, and a farce are decreasing amounts of, uh, of a measurement of, of, a, um, of coinage. Scholars in the Midrashim debated why couldn't anybody in Belshazzar's court read the writing on the wall? And they offered all sorts of hypotheses. Perhaps the writing was, uh, was made in code, or perhaps it was written backwards or upside down. One of the rabbinical solutions is that it was written not in code, not upside down, and not backwards, it was written right to left, but rather than being written in horizontal columns, it was written in vertical columns, which is how it appears here. Now the question is, where did Rembrandt get the idea to write to uh, paint the writing in this particular format? And the answer seems almost certainly from Manasseh, because in a book that Manasseh had published just um, a couple of years after this painting was made, that is precisely how Manasseh explains the writing on the wall. Um, and here you see um, a, an excerpt from Manasseh's book and the writing as Manasseh presents it. Manasseh doesn't discuss any of the other rabbinic solutions. He simply presents this one. And so I think there could be very little question that when Rembrandt needed some help on this painting and wanted to know how to depict the writing that was uh, composed on Belshazzar's wall. Um, he must have asked either some acquaintance in the Jewish community, or maybe he knew Manasseh himself, and Manasseh served as his advisor. The other project is a book that Manasseh himself wrote. The book is called Piedra Gloriosa, uh, The Glorious Stone. And this is uh, the, the bulk of the book is a messianic reading of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, also from, from Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream where a statue, um, was, a, a large rock came rolling down a hill and uh, broke, up, broke a statue uh, into pieces. And Daniel's reading of that dream was that this represented the end of the um, of numerous kingdoms, and that different parts of the statue represented uh, the Greek uh, Empire, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire, all of which are crushed by this stone. And the stone represents the Messiah, who will institute a fifth kingdom, uh, the kingdom of, of God, and this will reign um, for eternity. Manasseh took this story and the stone that appears in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and argues that the same exact stone appears in other episodes of the Bible. Um, it's the same stone that David uses in his sling to slay Goliath, and it's the exact same stone that um, Jacob lays his head down upon while he dreams of angels going up and down the ladder. The same stone, which represents in all three cases, the Messiah. Manasseh thought that his book could use some illustrations, 
And what we find in a couple of extant copies, I think um, eight or nine extant copies of the book are these illustrations, which are by Rembrandt. Upper left hand, you see a Nebuchadnezzar statue being uh, broken by the stone. Uh, the lower left, you see Jacob's head lying on the stone as the angels go up and down the ladder. The bottom right is uh, David slaying Goliath. And the upper right is um, Daniel's vision uh, of, the, of the beasts. Did Manasseh directly com commission Rembrandt for these etchings to appear in his book? Unfortunately, we don't have any direct documentation that he did. It seems very possible, but it's also possible that the etchings were commissioned not by Manasseh, and so that maybe there wasn't a true collaboration, but by um, Isaac Voschus or some other Gentile uh, owner of these books who then went to Manasseh to provide illustrations. We know that Manasseh thought the book needed illustrations, but whether he went to Rembrandt or uh, somebody else or did them himself, we simply do not know. What's interesting is that in a couple of other extant copies of this book, um, the illustration that you see in the upper right here is replaced by, um, well, actually all four illustrations are replaced by very similar illustrations by an artist who, we don't know who, it could have been Salon Italia, the same artist who did the portrait of Manasseh. But the only real difference, besides the fact that they're not as good as Rembrandt's etchings, is that in this upper, in the illustration you see here in the upper right, um, this depiction of God as a bodily figure doesn't appear. And it's possible that Manasseh got in trouble because he was publishing a book that included a physical depiction of God. And perhaps um, these new illustrations that did not include the physical depiction of God um, were a kind of substitute in order to placate the, the board of directors of the community. Here we have the, um, the signed by the members, by the directors of the community. This is the document in which Manasseh is refused permission to print his book. We don't know what they found so troubling, but it's very likely that it was just that illustration showing God as a bodily figure. So this whole question of Manasseh's relationship to Rembrandt is an interesting one, both because it's Rembrandt and we're all interested in Rembrandt, but because it also may represent an interesting collaboration and connection between um, the greatest artists of the Dutch Golden Age and this flourishing community of Portuguese Jews in what I think of as one of the greatest cities of Europe. And um, there you go. I will stop here and I'm perfectly happy to take questions. Sorry, having computer troubles. Will you mind unsharing the screen and we'll do some Q&A? Yes. There we go. So um, let's start with the first question, which is, uh, I understand from the Jewish Live series that they approached authors and asked them who they want to write about. Did they ask you to write about Manasseh or was that your choice? And if so, why did you choose Manasseh? Um, it's a good question. They asked me if I would write one on Spinoza. So yeah, they approached me and I said, well, no, I already wrote a biography of Spinoza. I don't want to write another one. <laughs> I probably have a no compete clause with myself. Um, but then I suggested to them Manasseh ben Israel. And they said, who? But fortunately, one of the academic editors, um, directors of the series um, was really interested in having a volume of Manasseh. And I just, I thought in the back of my mind, wouldn't it be great to have a biography of Manasseh? Because it really isn't one that brings all the up-to-date research to bear. Um, and so, they were willing. Um, I don't think it's probably as good a seller as their volume on Barbara Streisand, but um, I do think it's nice. It was really an, an interesting project, and I think it's good that there's a biography of Manasseh because I think he deserves the attention. Um, was he born and raised Jewish, or did the family kind of become Jewish after, you know, a certain age? 
Well, he was born in Portugal, so he would have had to be born in an ostensibly Catholic family, a conversal family. Um, did they practice Judaism in secret? Possibly, maybe likely, because they were denounced to the Inquisition. But people were being denounced to the Inquisition not only because they were practicing Judaism in secret. They may not have been practicing Judaism in secret, but they were a business competitor. It was a way to get people out of the way. Um, but he was quite young when they moved to Amsterdam and so would have been introduced to Judaism, you know, normative Judaism at a very young age. Do you think his challenges with the other other two rabbis that you mentioned were because of his per fiery personality or because because of his background, which seemed to be different than the other rabbis and therefore maybe have affected his worldview? Well, his background was the same as Rabbi Abouab's. Um, I see one of the questions is Rabbi Salev Mortera. Mortera was a Dutch rabbi of Portuguese descent. Actually, Mortera was not of Portuguese descent. Mortera uh, came from Venice um, and was either a, a member of the Ponent, his family was either a member of the Ponentine community there, which is essentially what we call the community of Italian Jews. But there's also a tradition that insists that he was an Ashkenazic uh, Jew. So, no, I, I don't think it had anything to do with his background. He had the same background as most of the members of the community. And Rabbi Aboab and Rabbi uh, well Pardo, I don't think was born in Portugal, so I, that wouldn't explain it. I think it was the fact that he was probably a difficult person to get along with. I don't think he was as learned as erudite as Mortera, um, but also I think there was concern about his engagement with um, with the Gentile world. There was the Jewish community, the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam was essentially a community of refugees. And they did not want to upset their Dutch hosts because they didn't want to be expelled. Although I, I don't think the Dutch were about to commit the same mistake that Spain had made. The, the Dutch were too economically savvy to get rid of this community, which is making such a good contribution to the economy. Um, but the I think the Jewish community never really lost this sense of insecurity. And they were always very conscious of how they were being perceived by the Dutch. And one of the rules that both the Dutch had laid down on the community and that the community laid down on itself was that you're not supposed to engage in theological discussions with Gentiles. They were afraid of Jews trying to convert Christians. And perhaps Manasseh's deep engagement with the Gentile world was of concern to the Jewish leaders because they thought it would be of concern to the Dutch. So when you call him the most famous Jew in the world, what's the basis for that? um creative license okay <laughs> well he was he was the most famous jew in europe without there's no question um in western europe and eastern europe um because of his publishing business uh because of his treatises um he was he, i think it's fair to say he was the most well-known jew maybe not the most well-respected among jewish communities but in the gentile world he was the the leading jew did he write any of his books in Hebrew or were they all written in, as a question from Rena, in, in Dutch or another language? He wrote one work in Hebrew, um, his treatise on the immortality of the soul, Nishma Chaim. Most of his other treatises he wrote in Spanish, although they were translated either concurrently or soon after into Latin, so they would be accessible to a Gentile readership. And um, there are a few treatises in portuguese especially his guide to jewish life um for convert for new new christians returning to judaism because they would be able to read portuguese he wrote um a treatise in english um on related to his readmission project um i don't there, there's some letters in dutch but dutch was not a language that he wrote any of his works in well, his, actually yeah. sorry i'm wrong about that there was a uh, a, he had to give um, a speech welcoming uh, Queen Henrietta from England when she visited the synagogue, uh, and he gave that speech in Dutch. Rena wants to know, so why writing? Why did he write in Spanish? Because that was the language of high literature for this community. Portuguese was the language in the home. It was also the language in which they conducted business. Their their notary doc, their business documents um, and transactions were either in Portuguese or Dutch. But when it came to education, to high literature, um, to philosophical literature, um, Spanish was the language. Interesting. Does his writings, do they hold up? Like if you're, when you read his stuff, 
does he have books where there's philosophy or on Jewish or on, on like when he tries to reconcile um, texts in the Bible, do they hold up today? Do people read them and are they more just giving us idea of what the time was like back at, when he was writing? Um, I, I don't think I would say they hold up. I, I do think his, so if you're a philosopher and you're interested in Jewish perspectives on free will, both in terms of philosophical arguments and scriptural textual support, um, I think he's an interesting writer uh, on that topic. Um, but I think he's more interesting for giving us a, a portal into the mindset of a 17th century Jewish intellectual. Okay. Jane wants to know how long did he stay in England on his expedition? Uh, two years, or almost two years. Diana makes a statement that she thinks, I believe, or has a question whether his book, Hope of Israel, did that inspire European Jews to go to North America? Or was that just a, no, a book not, that had any as far as impact? I know. But it did inspire a lot of messianic thinking among uh, Gentiles. Um, of course, they had a very different view of who the Messiah was, right. whether it was the second coming or first coming. But it, it was probably his most widely read work in the time. Hmm. What um, you obviously mentioned Spinoza, and we spent a lot of time talking about Manasseh. What was their relationship? Did they have one? Um, we don't know for sure. And Manasseh is often described as Spinoza's teacher um, and intellectual mentor. I, I think to call Manasseh Spinoza's intellectual mentor is very misleading because the two men really were diametrically opposed. Uh, Spinoza, in fact, in some of his writings, has some harsh things to say about uh, Manasseh's intellectual projects without naming Manasseh, but it's clear that's who he's talking about, like this idea that you can reconcile the different parts of scripture. Um, if Manasseh was Spinoza's teacher, it's very likely he was only his teacher in elementary school, and so teaching him Hebrew and uh, basic Torah lessons. He was not Manasseh, Manasseh was not Spinoza's teacher when it came to either Jewish philosophy or uh, Talmud or higher, you know, higher studies, uh, as far as we know. How did Manasseh make a living? Was he, I mean, was it really through being the rabbi and his his stipend there? Was it through the press? I mean, did he die? Was he poor? He was poor. He always had money problems. I think the reason he became a publisher was to supplement what was a pretty meager salary as a rabbi. And so that would have been how he made his living. Um, he was he was taking huge orders. I mean, um, Jewish communities in Eastern Europe were ordering hundreds of uh, sidurim, um or um, you know basic prayer books or Bibles or other uh, Judaica texts. So was he just was he not using his money wisely? Because it seems like he would have been generating some income through that business. You would think it, we really don't know. Um, and we, and we don't know how serious his debts were. He, all we really know is that he was always complaining about his money. Um, and he had, um, he didn't have a huge family, but um, yeah, it's a good question. I wish I had a better answer for that. People asked, do we, did he have um, like family that survived? Do we know people who are now like to this day related to him? Is his, there were any family members of distinction or did it? Do we kind of lose track of his family after he passed away? Uh, we pretty much lose track. Both of his sons died relatively young. Um, he he had a daughter. Um, we know so little about her, but no, as far as I know, I've never come across any indication that there are descendants of, of Manasseh. So uh, tell us what you're working on these days. What's your new projects? We'll segue there before we, we end our this program. Well, I just, I actually, um, leaving... I, I'm supposed to write a book on Maimonides at some point, which um, in a series that Cambridge University Press calls Why Read So-and-So Today, um, Why Read Maimonides Today. But I just published, for those who are interested in 17th century Dutch art, I just published a biography of the painter Franz Hals, um, just came out two weeks ago, called The Portraitist, uh, Franz Hals and His World. And, um, you know, the, the same general... Um, topic of art intellectual cultural religious life in the dutch golden age um but not, not at all focused on a jewish theme 
Can you tell us about the book you published, I guess the graphic novel you published with your son, Ben? Yeah, um, Ben had just graduated uh, from the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I guess it was about um, almost 10 years ago. And I thought, well, let's do something together, Mr. Artist, now that you're, I put all that money into your artistic training. Um, and I thought it'd be a good way to get his career going. So um, I said, let's do a book on 17th century philosophy. So it's essentially um, a graphic book about philosophy in the 17th century from Galileo through Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, John Locke, and others up to Newton. And um, I provided, I wrote the text and, and Ben did 900 illustrations by hand. Um, I, he said it was really hard because he has no background in philosophy and there was a lot of conversation back and forth. He'd say, he'd say Dad, what does Descartes mean by this? What does Spinoza mean? What is this? How am I supposed to illustrate this? But I think in the end, he did a magnificent job. Um, he got a little tendonitis in his wrist, but um, I think in the end, he did a, an amazing job of illustrating abstract philosophical, not just abstract philosophical topics, but the personalities of the philosophers themselves and their social relations. The book, the book was entitled Heretics, with an exclamation point, The Wondrous and Dangerous Beginnings of Modern Philosophy. People had asked that. Now, I'll put that in an email follow-up. My last question is about your book that was um, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, Rembrandt's Jews. So I, I guess we're getting an idea of which part of history you live in, yeah. and where you live. There, there are worse places to live, I think. As, yes. What, um, I mean, I, I haven't read it. It was, if it was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, I assume it was very good. What was the like essence of the book? What was the point you were, you were making in that book, Rembrandt's Jews? The point I was making was first to address the mythology around Rembrandt and his alleged sympathy and love for the Jewish people. But more generally, I mean, I, do, I think you do find in Rembrandt and in 17th century Dutch art, a very naturalistic representation of Jewish individuals, Jewish sites like synagogues and cemeteries, and Jewish themes. I thought, well, there's a really interesting topic there. Why is it that in contrast with the gross caricature of Jews that you find in medieval art. Why is it that in 17th century Dutch art, all of a sudden we're seeing Jews depicted just as ordinary individuals, not just by Rembrandt, but by the landscape artist, uh, Jacob van Ruysdael, by um, Emmanuel de Witt, who painted two paintings of the interior of the Portuguese synagogue, treating this like just any other site of religious activity. Um, and I, so I investigate that question and relate it to the way in which the Dutch themselves saw their society as the new chosen, God's new chosen people, because the Dutch had just liberated themselves from Spanish d domination. Well, who are the Spaniards? They're Catholics, idol worshipers. Well, who were the Egyptians? They were idol worshipers. And so just as God liberated the ancient Israelites from e slavery in Egypt, so the Dutch, so God allowed the Dutch to be liberated from uh, Habsburg Spanish control. And so the Spaniards saw themselves as God's new chosen people, and they saw their land as the new Jerusalem. And that might that helps explain why there was so much, so much Jewish, so many Jewish themes in 17th century Dutch art, and especially their fascination with the Hebrew Bible. Wow, terrific. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking us on a um adventure into life of Manasseh in Israel and to the 17th century um Amsterdam. And we look forward to having you back to focus on Spinoza. I want to thank pleasure. everybody. Thank you, everybody else. And then again, for being our first University of Wisconsin professor online, that is. So people are now texting me, all these Wisconsin people. I didn't know that Ada Gilbert went to University of Wisconsin. So there you go. There are badgers everywhere. Apparently. Anyway, well, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us on this um, tour into Jewish history. We look forward to having you back. We have a few more programs this week. Then I'm off to Israel. Maybe I'll send you some letters from Israel. So I'm hoping everybody right. will stay he stay healthy and safe, especially those traveling. Take care, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Safe travels. Ciao.